This is a writing for publication class, and these are all master students and PhD students who are um, actively involved in, you know, trying to publish their work. And some people in the room have books, and some people have, you know, um, are, are just starting with their um, uh, amassing their publication history. So there's a wide variety of experience. Um, and probably a wide variety of questions too. Um, and one of the things we're interested in is your um, experience with starting Waxwing Up and also um, uh, how you're making sort of submission, uh, determinations from the submission queue about what sort of deserves publication and, um, and maybe you know, communicating with authors um, in, in you know, um, either when they don't get accepted or, you know, when, um, when they do end up sort of part of the, um, the family, I guess, after they get, get accepted. So I'm going to turn it over to the students and have them ask you some questions. But, okay. um, and, you know, Justin's also a, a poet and a prose writer. And so he's, you know, he's on both sides. So you can ask questions about, um, about the, you know, how those relationships intersect too, if you want. So what questions do you have for Justin? I think the first one is, why did you start Waxwing? Uh, good question. <laughs> I guess I'd kind of, uh, you can hear me okay, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, if my cat jumps on my lap, that, that this may happen. <laughs> one of my three cats. Um, I guess it's an idea that I've been, you know, kind of kicking around for, for years. Um, I was an undergrad in the 90s at uh, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and they had, um, I think it still exists, it's called, I think the Oakland Review. So Oakland is just a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, you know, it's not Oakland, California. And that was my first um, experience working with a, with a literary journal. And so I started, like a lot of people, you know, as a reader. Um, and then at some point I was a fiction editor, you know, after like two or three years, and that kind of responsibility um, all the managerial work, figuring out, uh, like Katie just said, kind of like, why are we going to take this story um, and not take it? And beginning to form those editorial um, sensibilities. Um, then years and years later, yeah, I guess maybe like five years ago, I started talking with some people behind the scenes, just friends who are also writers who I thought might be interested in starting a journal. And I didn't have a clear mission at the time. You know, I just knew that it was something that I, that I would love to do. And so there were four of us total, about four, just over, well, four and a half years ago, maybe, um, who got together here in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, my partner, uh, Aaron, and then uh, Bojan Lewis and Sarah Sams, and just a group of friends who were hanging out. Uh, we got a bottle of whiskey out and we just started talking about it. And it was really laid back, it was really low key. And we ended up talking about it. They, they crashed at our house for a couple of nights and we really just sort of asked the question that you're asking, you know, like, well, why do this? You know what I mean? There are so many journals out there. There's so many great journals. Um, the life of a journal is often so short, you know, cause it's just really hard. Um, actually uh, in terms of the workload and, and all of it, just to sustain it. Sometimes I'll see a journal come out and they look great. And then, and tears they're gone and, and I don't always know I just assume it's many many factors and so part of it too is like can we commit to this thing and so we were like you know I said 10 years and they were like that's too long though no. um, they were like okay let's commit like five years we're gonna do this for five years and then see where we're at if we're gonna continue the journal this October well next month we're publishing issue 13 and that'll be four years you know um, but why did we start it I mean I think that the question we asked was um, what excites us most about like literary publishing right now? What excites us most about the, so, the sort of literary landscape um, writing and the, the consensus was cultural diversity, you know? And so that became the beginning of us sort of sculpting that as a mission statement. Uh, we were all on board with it. It is still to me the most exciting thing about about literature. I can't divorce so-called aesthetics from cultural issues, you know, which are so varied. Uh, just in this one uh, culture, cultures really of, of, of the Americas. And so that was part of it too, is we decided we wanted to be an international journal. 
you know, so we publish translations. Um, I know there's, there's debate and uh, controversy about publishing translations bilingually. I talked uh, behind the scenes with Fadi Judah a bit about that. Um, he's not a huge fan of it, but that's kind of what we do. And so we've been publishing, I don't know how many countries at this point, you know, we use Google Analytics uh, here and there to track like who's reading it and, and where they are. Um, and so I guess, yeah, um, maybe a long-winded answer to your question, but uh, we decided that, that cultural diversity was really important to us as a journal and that that would be our sort of welcome banner, really, you know, to people who submit. There's a um, there's a kind of interesting conversation I think going on, um, maybe nationally and internationally, about the idea of like blind submissions and um, and editorial bias and all that kind of thing. So I'm I'm curious about because um, they're not blind at Waxwing, right? And they're not blind here at Iron Horse, which is our journal that that um, some of us work on. Um, <clears throat> I mean, was that a deliberate choice? Um, or is it, you know, just the, sort of the standard and that's you know, what you decided to go with? Um, I don't know. My impression probably, I mean, the literary journal here at, uh, I teach at NAU at Northern Arizona University and Thin Air is their journal. Um, submit, <laughs> it's a cool journal. <laughs> you know, it's run all by grad students, so you probably know what, what that's like, right? Um, they're always trying to get more people to submit. And, um, but yeah, they read blind. They said that in their first meeting. I think that's probably the default for journals because I get it on the surface of why that, why that makes sense. I don't think I have to even explain that, like the logic of that. But it's, it's based in, I think, a kind of ethical stance of fairness and, and all that. But especially with a journal like Waxwing, I don't think we can really do that. Um, you know, it's, it's important to know who we're publishing. I, I'm not a, you know, I don't want to geek out on literary theory and it's really, it's like not my bag, but I mean, I, I, the poem is not just on the page for me. I mean, you know, I, when I teach poetry, like I'm teaching John Murillo today to my undergrads and we're going to look at Up Jump the Boogie and we're going to watch like 10, I think 12 minutes of video with John talking about his work, how he started out as a hip hop artist, getting to see uh, John and his like really cool hats that he wears, you know, and just like his thing, like who he is and you know, and, and the banter. That's, to me, the question is almost related to like when you give a poetry reading or performance, what are you doing? Um, there's a great uh, talk with um, Ross Gay and I think Tina Chang in the New School you, uh, YouTube video. You can find it pretty quickly. And they talk a little bit about that. Like, oh, do you, when you, when you read, do you say much about yourself or do you kind of just sit, stand there and like read from the page and think, well, that's what I'm here for. I'm going to read my poems and you don't need to know much about me or you don't need to hear me banter. Uh, I get that sort of larger debate, but it's important for me. Um, I mean, I guess I'm kind of a new historicist or whatever, but to know the other stuff. I mean, if I love a writer, Virginia Woolf or uh, Whitman or, wh or whoever it is, I mean, I'm reading the biographies and the letters and all that stuff. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I don't think that like you have to, but I almost for me as a decision, feel like I kind of need that. You know what I mean? Like it does alter the reading. It just does. Again, I'm not, um, I'm not a new critic, I guess, in that way. So I get the debate and I'm not saying I'm right and people are wrong for, re for reading blind, but for Waxwing, we feel like we want to know who's, who's submitting. You know, and we, we, we want, you know, just this morning I saw Todd Koneko, who's one of the kind of the three main editors and Todd and I, um, and then we'll talk about this probably soon, um, go through the slush as the, we're the poetry editors. And then Aaron Stalkup is the fiction or, and nonfiction prose editor. And just this morning, Todd went on Facebook and said, hey, you know, I just want to say that uh, I, Justin and I, I don't know if he mentioned me, but like we've noticed we're not getting a lot of submissions from trans writers and like we, we want those submissions. You know, so sort of back to the initial thing of like why we started the journal um, is we do want to be inclusive and representative and we're in a bad moment. Um, it's not brand new, but I think we're in a bad moment where it's attacked even more, feels like more than, than ever. I can remember in my lifetime, um, even the nineties, I feel like there were the so-called culture wars and, you know, really racist books like the bell curve and stuff like that. And it's just back in full force where people are like, feeling like, like I have to defend my choice to, to publish a journal that, you know, it, it promotes cultural diversity to me. It's sort of, 
just it's messed up <laughs> like it's just to me it seems so obvious you know that that's important it's like who we are you know i mean even just in terms of accuracy it's like who we are as, as culture and cultures you know what i mean like so again we we want to know who we're publishing um i don't often read the bio for, to be honest i just kind of go to poems but i will read the bio you know at some point if whoever you know wh whoever submitted you know, every time we reject somebody, I'm, I'm like, who's, who is this person? And it's a small world, as you know. I mean, um, I often know who the people are right away. I see the name. I mean, there's, there's some people in Slush right now. I'm really excited when I have time. <laughs> I don't know when that will be to get in there. I'm like, oh, this person sent poems to, to their, I'm so, that's such an honor, you know, because I, I already know I love their work. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I answered that question very well, but, but it's important for us, again, to know, uh, yeah. not just the, on the page, but like who that person is. Right, right, because the biases work with bi with blind submissions anyway, right? I mean, that's what some of the study shows. Yeah. Um, some, you know, um, other questions for Justin about black donor submission queue or aesthetics. We were talking about aesthetics. I guess as uh, like looking at it editorially, how do you kind of decide on the aesthetics? that you want in your journal and if you get things that you like that don't necessarily fit the aesthetics is it a that just just a personal objection because like well it doesn't fit the journal or would you still publish it i mean if you could talk about that a little bit yeah i'm sorry to give a maybe a bad answer to the question but it, it's not really part of my calculation i don't have um you know and a lot of journals i think say this in their submission like we have no you can see kind of a sort of Jargon or something, and I'm not putting them down for saying it, but like we have no aesthetic preference. You know, we just publish the best, you know, the best of what we get. And of course, behind that, there probably is a sort of aesthetic uh, sensibility. So I think it's important for me, and for Tom, I could talk more about the poetry end of it. You know, I think the, our prose editor has a more specific aesthetic sensibility, which is very um, sort of experimental. Um, you know, uh, in love with the language and that kind of stuff. And, and we do too as, as poetry editors, but I like to be open to whatever it is I'm, I'm reading, you know, not have an aesthetic bias. I probably have them, you know, and I've, I've started to figure out what some of them are through reading Slush with Todd, you know, um, but, I, but it's, they're, still, they're still hard for me to, to describe and it would seem unfair of me, I think, as an editor to even like put that in the guidelines, you know what I mean? Um, Todd's got a thing, just this is a very specific example. He's admitted it in his own his language. is like he's got a thing for contrapuntal poems. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. Like I, I just, I don't dislike them, but it's not like, like when he sees them, he gets excited. In other words, like he sees these poems like in columns, you know, speaking to each other, like multi polyphonous type poems. I think they're really cool, but I don't have a bias toward them, you know. Um, if anything, I think at times I can find them difficult to read. So behind the scenes, the discussions we have inside Submittable, um, I guess if we ever revealed those, would probably show a lot about the question you're asking. But it's hard for me, to be honest, to articulate a particular aesthetic sensibility for myself. Um, just like the poetry that I love, the poetry that I teach is, is pretty varied. You know what I mean? Um, I, I love, I love, you know, Kenneth Koch as much as I love, you know, uh, Vivi Francis or uh, just two poets off the top of my head who in ways are very, very different poets aesthetically, you know what I mean? Um, and even those poets themselves, of course, if you just look at their, their Koch's body of work is much larger, but their aesthetics are very different within their own bodies of work, you know what I mean? So, Am I, am I, am I helping you? Out yeah. There? Yeah. That's, that's really, that's really helpful. Question. I think sometimes again, people lead with aesthetics, you know, as editors. Um, and I don't, I, I, I lead the other way with what we talked about earlier is, is a cultural representation, um, who people are. And that does not always apparent in the work. So that's tricky, right? I mean, it's not like I'm reading through the slush and I'm like, where's the trans writers at? You know what I mean? Cause it's not always, <laughs> And that's a mistake. That's a mistake to read that way. And I, and I don't read that way, but I'm, we're looking for it. And again, part of um, moving away a little bit from your question is just like when you have that mission statement and like you demonstrate it, you hope to demonstrate it every issue, like writers are going to be sending to you from all different kinds of uh, identities. You know what I mean? So it's not like you have to 
um, can keep pushing that as an idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's great. Thanks. We, um, we talked about the publication of Good Bones uh, by Maggie Smith and how that was potentially a turning point at Waxwing. Um, I'm curious about life before and life after a poem goes viral and what that looks like um, and what the experience was on your side of things. Yeah, it was, um, and still is in some ways, you know, a, a crazy ride. I mean, there's, you still see that poem pop up, you know what I mean? Really horrific things will, con will continue to happen in the world and that poem will um, keep being shared. So before Good Bones, uh, the, the, we had a poem that it didn't go viral, but it was shared a lot. And it was the, um, the title poem of uh, Ross Gay's latest book, uh, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Um, we, had, we had published that and that was shared a lot. And so that was really fun. But then Good Bones was this whole other thing, again, because it was tied to um, the shooting in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub. Um, and then the assassination of a, um, a member of parliament. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the person's name. And those two events um, were just so grim, um, I guess that people were, it's one of the things I like to talk about with my undergrads, especially the beginning ones, is like poetry may not seem like it's the most popular, and it's not uh, art form in the culture, but it seems like people will go to it, you know what I mean, in moments of, of almost unexplainable grief and also joy, you know, at wedding and all that. So I don't know, it kind of reminded me of like why, why poetry matters. And it was um, kind of a whirlwind, I guess, for us, because we were getting calls from newspapers <clears throat> around the world being interviewed. And Maggie, of course, was the main person being interviewed. But what's changed for the journal is just, you know, we're getting like a shit ton of submissions now. I mean, we were getting, they were increasing each issue we put out. We were getting more and more submissions because, you know, you're building a, a thing, you're building a reputation. But now uh, we're getting more than we can handle um, in financial, like submittable. We've been in submittable for four years now. So we still just pay $10 a month and we get 300 submissions a month. And um, they raised that, but because we got in, you know, early, we, we never had to, to pay more. But if we allowed more than 300 a month, we'd be paying a lot more money than we can afford. We have no budget. It's just all out of pocket, you know, from the, the main editors, Todd, me, and Aaron. So we've had to cap the submissions, you know, so I'll blame Maggie for that. We have to cap the <laughs> with good bones effect. Um, <laughs> kind of good to be honest because it's really hard for us uh me and todd are the only people who read the, the poetry and each of us reads every single submission we get um so it's just a ton of work you know aside from you know i teach four classes a semester and you know i have a, a 20 month year old uh first child and learning how to parent and all that's just a ton of work you know um so i think maggie's kind of helped us out a little <laughs> are there things that people do in their submissions that um that make them stand out for the wrong reasons yeah i mean not not a lot you know it's it's a drag i mean kind of like what i said a minute ago we're, that we're capped at 300 you know we'll, we'll see uh we saw a few times this when we reopened for submissions people sending uh poems as like individual you know submissions and it wouldn't really matter that much if we didn't have to cap it. Do you know what I mean? If we had unlimited submissions, you'd just be like, you know, like please read our submission guidelines more clearly. But, you know, again, remembering what it was like to just start out as an undergrad and, and my, my, first, my poetry teacher, Jim Daniels, who's great, was very like, a great, he's like, send your work out. You know, you should be sending your work out even at, at that age. And I was kind of intimidated. So I know people will, will start sending the work out and they don't really know like the things we take for granted. I mean, I, I just sort of, you've been doing it for so long. It's like, this is how you write a cover letter. This is, you know, you put all your submit your submissions in one document and submittable or whatever software the, that journal uses. And when people are just starting out, they don't always know that, you know? So in other words, it's sort of like read the syllabus. Like that sounds so obvious to us, but it's not. And so, you know, I taught in community colleges. I'm glad first before, um, you know, four year universities and saw so many students just sort of 
you know, their, their families, a lot of them didn't ever went to college. Like my family doesn't go to college. And so same thing when I went to Carnegie Mellon, I was just like, holy shit. Like everybody seemed to like know exactly how to, to, to do everything and things that, you know, you sort of take for granted. So I'm very sympathetic in other words to, I get annoyed. I admit it sometimes, but I'm um, have to remind myself that they don't know. And so it's not like we're just going to delete that submission. I'm still going to read it. And I send very nice emails just saying, Hey, you know, just check out the submission guidelines. It says this. And usually they'll write back and be like, I'm really sorry. I didn't, I didn't notice it or I didn't know. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, the sympathetic cases once in a while. Yeah. I mean, someone will send like a bio that's, you know, like five pages long and you, and you read the bio and you're like, this person should, should know better. You know, I don't need to know every journal that you've been published in every single place that's awarded you a grant. It's just boring. I don't, I don't know. Uh, why people do that. And there's been some other things behind the scenes that I probably can't go into too specifically, but here and there, like we'll accept work. And then, you know, recently happened like close to, close to we're going to publish the issue. Someone said, Hey, actually, you know what? Someone else decided to take it. And we're just like, <laughs> like, you should know better. Like, I know who you are. Like I, you published your work and that's a real, I think that's very disrespectful to do to any journalist to pull your work because a journal that you can it's very obvious what's happening. They consider that journal to be more, more CV bling or something than Waxwing. And yeah, I know we're just starting out. Um, I'm not offended in that way or it's like, Oh, they're going to pay me. And so that's interesting. And we don't, we don't have money to pay our contributors. You know, that's a long-term goal we have. Um, once we kind of establish ourselves, we are hoping to like go nonprofit and all that and pay contributors but that's getting long-term plan. So yeah, here and there, I'm sort of disappointed in particular people who I, I know should know better who do that. And that seems really shitty, you know, to, to disrespect a journal. Um, I don't get it. I don't get it, but it happens, you know. I have a question about um, putting together packets. Like you said, people sometimes submit one at a time, but normally you put together a group of three to five pieces. Um, and and how? Um, and I, I actually don't submit poetry, but I submit flash. How cohesive should those pieces be? Um, I, I guess do they should they have a relationship to each other? Um, should they not? Um, are are you taking multiple poems from there? Are you taking, or just one? Uh, like, how does that work with the packet of work? Yeah, I think we, uh, we do say um, that you can submit a single poem. I think it used to say that the sort of standard, like three to five or, or something like that. Um, but then a couple of people had queried and said, hey, I've just got this one poem, you know, can I send it? So we're like, there's no reason I can think of to say no to that. So we changed the guidelines to, I think one, one to five. Um, and I think it's cool when the poems kind of speak to each other. Uh, I don't think that it would re require it. I know there's been published in individual issues where the poems uh, felt like almost like from different manuscripts, you know, and so we're not opposed to that at all. I mean, as long as we love the work. Um, we have sometimes taken like an individual poem. We've done this a number of times and just didn't, didn't love the other work enough that we said kind of behind the scenes, hey, you know, we're gonna take this one poem if it's still available um, and we wanna invite you or leave open this invitation uh, to send companion poems, you know what I mean? Just email them to us and we'll consider them because we love to kind of surround that poem with, uh, with, with other stuff. It's not that the poem is not strong enough in its own right to publish it. Like we're gonna publish the poem, um, but we would like other poems maybe to kind of speak to it. So I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Um, and that's been cool because that's happened a bunch of times now. I don't, I haven't counted, I would guess at least a dozen times over the, over the few years where we've um, gotten other poems to kind of surround that one that we took. And so you can kind of get a better sense of, of what that poet is up to. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So what happens at that five year mark when you get to the end of, you know, your sort of project, the, the projected initial life of the journal, how will you decide, do you think, if, you know, to go forward or, and will you go forward with the same sort of model or would that require a new sort of way to think about what the next five years or whatever might look like? 
Well, that's a great question. I think that, you know, we're, we're anticipating that moment, you know, so we don't have all of the answers yet. But I think one thing we want to do is, um, is to keep doing what we're doing. You know, I, I think that, I think it's a good journal. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep doing it if I didn't think so. Um, this next issue, you know, in October that's coming out, I mean, I'm, I'm just in love with, I'm in love with every issue we, we put out. Um, so I just want to kind of keep doing that and building audience and building um, community, being part of larger water community. So like Todd said this morning, like, you know, that we do want uh, more writers who identify as trans. It's just one example, again, of we, we feel like we can still do a better job, you know, as a journal, um, long-term plans. I'm wondering, like, you know, how uh, do you solicit books to review? Do you reach out to individuals who you know have things coming out or, you know, how do you um, select works to highlight and, um, and yeah, and why do you go with an in-house model? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we want to do again is have um, not just the, the people that we publish, but our masthead, it's very important, um, should be diverse, you know, and so part of what we wanted to do is just invite a bunch of people who we really sort of admired to be part of this thing, uh, to be part of Waxwing. And because again, we can't pay our staff, the, the, the least we can do is let them sort of, because we trust them, otherwise we wouldn't have brought them on board, is to let them choose what books they want to review and who they'd like to interview. It's basically what we call our contributing editors. The three things they do for us are book reviews, um, interviews with writers, and they also uh, soft solicit, I guess that's what we call it, where they invite people um, to send work, people that they think would be a good fit for the journal. And they do that in different ways. Sometimes they'll just send them directly to us through email, say, hey, here's this person, want to put you in touch, they're doing great work. Um, or they'll just basically encourage them to send through submittable and we'll see in the bio or the cover letter, hey, you know, Jenny Johnson um, said that she thought I'd be a great fit for your, for your magazine. So, you know, we do have like a, we have a Dropbox with all of our stuff in it and we do have a doc that um, is sort of like some books were interested in being reviewed. You know, I'll add a book to that once in a while. Um, and, you know, they have access to that. The contributing editors can look through that list if they're feeling like I don't really know what to review and say, oh, well, Todd recommends this book by whoever. But for the most part, they know what they're doing. I mean, they, they have a sense beyond this issue, like, it seems like sometimes a year or two in advance. I mean, Rajiv Mohabir is amazing. I mean, he's, he's been one of our, I think, best contributing editors in his sort of gusto. And he's sometimes like, can I review, can I review three books this issue? And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> Rajiv. Like, and so he actually did that. He kind of did a sort of omnibus um, review of uh, different Car Indo-Caribbean poets, which is an amazing review. And again, really important work just to get that out there. So we, we kind of let them, we trust them because they've just, they do, they write great reviews and, um, and interview uh, Dexter Booth in this next issue has got a review um, and an interview with the same writer, you know, to kind of look at it in two different ways. And um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but you know, we, we will get unsolicited uh, pitches and sometimes people will just send like an entire review and so we just write back and say, you know, because <clears throat> it's probably not clear from our guidelines. At the same time, I mean, you know, if we did accept reviews and interviews, we probably would have those tabs and submittable. But, you know, we'll just write back and say, hey, thanks so much. But um, we're thinking waxing would be a good fit for this. Um, it, it, it probably would be, but we don't have the room for it. And uh, like you said, everything is sort of in-house. Okay, great. Yeah, we, we had that question about whether it's... Um, okay to interview uh, a writer and then also review their book or if there's a conflict of interest inherent in that that we were looking at the colorado center for publishing i think the um with the colorado review they have a very specific um directive not to interview or not to review a book of somebody that you have a connection to you know which of course this world is so small so the idea of not having a connection <laughs> in some way to some of the writers that you know are interested in reviewing is maybe somewhat un unrealistic but um, anyway, we're talking about those, those relationships with those kinds of um, sort of, um, I don't know, what are we calling them in here? The, like support, 
materials or something that that writers will gather, you know, to participate in the larger conversation along with their own creative work. So yeah, I kind of like having having this sort of double lens on on writers and in particular issues. Like um, I think our very first issue, um, Bobby Francis had three poems in the inaugural uh, issue and I interviewed her, <clears throat> you know what I mean? So it was kind of a cool thing, I think, to see new work, you know, the, which became uh, part of uh, Forest Primeval, which won that, you know, that huge prize, which is amazing for Vivi. Um, but it was kind of cool, I, th I think, just to see us kind of, um, to hear her thoughts about poetry and whatever else I, I asked her, and then see the poems alongside that. So for me, that doesn't feel at all sort of like a conflict of interest. It feels like just an, a real investment in that particular writer. Um, and, um, and yeah, the next issue, we don't, we don't usually tell people what's in the next issues, but Vivi's title poem, you know, for the new book is in issue 13, um, which is, a, which is a huge honor. It's an amazing poem. Uh, it's like, and, and again, like this door opening into, into the new work, which, which I don't know. I only know the one, uh, and she sent another uh, poem alongside of it. In some ways, someone asked the question about poems going together. In some ways, they don't seem to go together. But in some ways they do, but they're both great poems, so um, we're going to publish them. I just noticed too that that's actually our cover. Oh wow! Um, How cool! Yeah, Ooh, that's awesome. My head. We just bought that from a local photographer um, here in Flagstaff, um, cool. and asked them if we could use it as the cover. So anyway, <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Yeah, it's giving all kinds of inside information. <laughs> um, Great. Any last questions for Justin before we let him go? He has a meeting coming up, I think. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Sorry it took a little while to get in the program. We're, I probably didn't give very clear instructions, so I'm glad you it's figured it out. Just, I have trouble with stuff like that. So. Yeah, no, I, me too. And this, we're sitting here surrounded by all kinds of wires and um, technology that I, you know, I only know one specific path through, so I totally understand. But um, thank you so much, and um, hopefully we'll run into you at AWP or something along those lines. So um, awesome. we have a reading um, the very first uh, kind of like the travel day on I think it's Wednesday night. Um, awesome. uh, New found and maybe one other journal, but yeah, I hope to run into you there in Tampa. Okay, great. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a great day. Take, take care.